I think we're ready to uh, transition to the keynote. Yes, we are. Um, we have um, Jane Nashida and Mei Wu. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an introduction. So if you don't want to come up immediately, the introductions are a little bit long. Um, so Jane Nishida is the Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of International and Tribal Affairs. She served on EPA's, she served as EPA's Acting Administrator from January 20, 2021 to March 11, 2021, before the confirmation of the current Administrator, Michael Reagan. She was appointed by President Biden, confirmed by the Senate, and sworn in as OITA's Assistant Administrator on September 24, 2021. She leads EPA's international and tribal portfolios and is responsible for the full range of EPA's international and tribal policies, strategies, and relationships. She represents EPA within the United States government and works closely with tribal governments, foreign governments, international organizations, and other key stake and rights holders on matters relating to environmental and public health. She has over 30 years of environmental experience working in federal and state government, as well as international and non-governmental organizations. Prior to joining the EPA in 2011, she served as the Senior Environmental Institutions Specialist at the World Bank. From 1995 to 2002, she was appointed as the Secretary of Maryland's Department of the Environment and has served as the Maryland Executive Director of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. She also held positions as Legislative Officer in Maryland Governor's Office and the Committee Council of Maryland General, General Assembly. Uh, for her education, higher education, she received a Bachelor of Arts in International Affairs from Lewis and Clark here in Portland, and a JD from Georgetown Law Center in Washington, D.C. I'm next going to introduce uh, Mei Wu, and then we can welcome them up here. So Mei Wu is Deputy Assistant Administrator for the U.S. EPA's Agency Office of Water. The Office of Water works to ensure that drinking water is safe, wastewater is safely returned to the environment, and surface water is properly managed and protected. As Assistant Administrator for the Office of International and Tribal, oh, we switch back to, we switch back to Jane. Let me see here. Well, quickly back to Jane. As Assistant Administrator for the Office of International and Tribal Affairs, she's at the forefront of current EPA tribal policy as part of the Biden-Harris administration's revitalization of a commitment to environmental justice for all. Um, she will review EPA's recent policy and rulemakings in this sphere and describes where she envisions EPA heading next. Mei Wu is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of Water and will provide a lens into EPA's tribal law and policy under the Clean Water Act. So let's welcome up Jane Nishida and Mei Wu, please. Thank you, Heather, and good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, and I also want to begin by thanking the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde for their hosting of this event, as well as the Region 10 uh, uh, RTOC. So it's a pleasure to be here. If I sound a little, a little incoherent, it's because I just flew from actually Italy from a G7 meeting. Uh, of the environment, climate change, and um, climate, energy, and environment uh, ministerial, where the countries of the United States, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Germany, Canada, and Japan just negotiated a 30-page document about the commitments of the G7 for uh, the protection of climate change energy, the clean energy transition in the environment. And the reason that I mention that is one of the important roles that I have, as was described by Heather, 
my office is responsible not only for the relationships with sovereign nations outside of the United States, but also with relationships with sovereign nations, i.e. tribal nations, within the United States. And it is my honor and uh, responsibility to make sure that even when we negotiate with our uh, partners uh, around the world, that there is inclusion of the reference to the rights of indigenous people. So what I would like to do is to quote from you the communique. Um, there'll be a lot of press about the communique with regards to what the G7 uh, countries did on commitment to climate change, uh, particularly the phase out of uh, unabated fossil fuel. But uh, I found the more important uh, provision, this provision, which says, and I'm going to read it uh, verbatim, we also recognize the important role of indigenous peoples in addressing climate change and, in, and the clean energy transition, among other environmental issues. And we commit to respecting the right, their rights as affirmed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So as I just mentioned, the environment, climate, and energy ministers from those G7 uh, countries just adopted this communique. Um, so it's a clear recognition, I think, of the rights of indigenous people. So with that, I also want to talk, uh, because I understand, I'm sorry that I wasn't here yesterday because I was negotiating this text uh, yesterday, or actually I was in, in, in route here. Um, and I understand, though, that there were some international, particularly transboundary issues that were raised. So before I talk about the... Uh, we talk about the tribal priorities for EPA in the domestic space. I wanted to highlight some of the things that EPA is doing with regards to transboundary pollution issues that really impact the tribes in Region 10. And the first one has to do with the Elk River Kootenai watershed. Um, and I don't know if there are any representatives from the Confederated Tribe of Idaho. I don't see anybody, but maybe they're online. So there's been a longstanding issue with regards to the mining development in British Columbia as it impacts the watershed in the United States, and particularly as it impacts tribal nations in the United States. So we have been working over 10 years with the uh, Kenai uh, Nation, uh, both on the US side and the Canadian side, to essentially try to refer this to an independent US-Canada uh, commission. It's called the International Joint Commission. And I am pleased to report that last month, or now it's, I guess, two months ago, on March 8th, the Canadian government finally agreed to a joint referral. So that means that the issue of transboundary mining pollution that is impacting the water quality, the fisheries, and natural resources of tribes on the US side of the border will now be going to this independent commission to be able to not only identify um, the transboundary impacts, but also to hopefully monitor and come up with uh, an, action, an action plan to address those transboundary uh, pollution issues. And this would not have been possible without the leadership that we had from tribal nations uh, pushing the US government and the Canadian government to be able to resolve this issue. Another uh, transboundary issue that EPA has been working on, and I know there are many representatives in the room from Alaska. Um, how many of you are impacted by the uh, uh, pollution, the legacy pollution to since Tuscola Chief Mine in Southeast Alaska? So I see a few hands. So again, that is an important issue that has been raised to EPA. We likewise have been negotiating with the Canadian government, trying to push them to push the province of British Columbia. And just this past week, the British Columbia government has now come up with a remediation plan that will hopefully start to address some of the remediation of that site that is affecting the Taku River and the lives of obviously um, the nations in Southeast Alaska. So that's another example. Since I'm gonna stay on Alaska for a minute and cite two more, 
the other one is the Arctic. And again, uh, we know that many of the uh, Alaskan uh, villages and nations are impacted about what's happening in the Arctic, particularly with regards to not only mining development, but also in terms of shipping uh, that is opening up uh, the impacts of climate change in the Arctic. And so EPA, along with other federal agencies, are working through what we call the Arctic Executive Steering Committee and raising the concerns of Alaska tribes to the executive committee um, that represents many of the Arctic nations um, in uh, north or northern uh, Alaska. And the final area that I wanted to touch on was, again, the mining issue. We see an, an explosion of mining. There's been the legacy mining in, in, in areas like Selsikad's Chief, but we also know that there are new proposed mines or expanse or proposed expansions of existing mines. And so we have, uh, through the White House uh, Council of Native Am uh, Americans, uh, developed a committee that is addressing the impacts of this explosion of mining, particularly as we look for a push for EV development to be able to address the impact on indigenous communities and particularly incorporating not only water quality issues, but also traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge. So those are just a couple of examples on the international front that we are working with. We also know, as uh, I will turn to my colleague in a minute, a minute, that water quality is a priority issue for tribal nations, not only for its intrinsic value in terms of water quality, but also for its importance in terms of the way of life. And with that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Wei Mu, uh, who is going to, Mei Wu, sorry. Again, I'm a little jet lagged. Uh, I just arrived last night at 11 o'clock, so forgive me if I'm a little incoherent this morning, uh, to describe this exciting uh, announcement that she is going to present, and then I'll come back and close it out with some additional uh, priorities for EPA. Thank you, Jane. Um, amazingly, that was not the first time I've been called Waymo, so... <laughs> I'll answer to anything, but thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and, you know, the, the Biden-Harris administration really has prioritized the relationships with tribal nations. Um, I, before I joined EPA, I was with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture for two and a half years. And, and there it was, um, you know, I was working closely with tribes on a lot of food sovereignty issues, too, um, including helping create the um, indigenous animal harvesting and meat processing grant program. So, you know, it's across the whole administration that um, this has been um, such an important, um, such an important priority and, and really the pledge to create a better uh, future for tribal nations is, is just as strong um, there and, and strong here today at EPA. So um, the EPA Office of Water, we do have a tribal action plan that has really effectively framed our work um, over the this administration. And we're really making great strides in meeting um, many of our commitments there. Um, and we'll continue to do so for the years to come um, from increasing infrastructure funding and capacity development in strengthening tribal sovereignty and expanding water governance. And so we're really proud to be working with our partners in Region 10 and um, all around to fulfill these commitments. So today, we published our final rule to protect tribal reserve rights, revising our longstanding federal water quality standards regulations under the Clean Water Act. And so with this rule, we are taking a significant step in aligning the Clean Water Act with tribal reserve rights to protect resources and practices, such as the rights for subsistence fishing and wild plants. And we know that this is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Very exciting. We know that this is long overdue that we, um, you know, recognize the unique status of treaty reserve rights, but um, it's really especially exciting to be here in Region 10 to make this announcement because it is really the work that um, that we did with Region 10 um, eight years ago or so with the Columbia River Intertribal Commission um, to determine like a more 
accurate fish consumption rate for the tribal members exercising their tribal, their treaty protected fishing rights. And we worked with the state of Oregon and the state of Washington um, to incorporate that rate into their human health um, uh, water quality criteria. And it is those experiences that really directly informed this framework that we have um, finalized today um, for considering and providing protection for tribal reserve rights to natural resources. Um, and this is the first time that this framework is being explicitly implemented into a national EPA regulation. So for years, we've been doing this on a case-by-case, state-by-state basis. And we heard over those years from y'all and from the states that um, it caused a lot of uncertainty. And so when we proposed the, the right, this treaty reserve rights rule at the end of 2022, we received a lot of um, detailed and diverse comments. I wanna thank all of y'all for um, sharing those thoughts with us. But um, particularly we received um, really thoughtful comments from 50, almost 50 tribes and tribal organizations. And they emphasized how important the clean water is to the exercise of tribal reserve rights, including sustenance fishing and cultural practices. So again, we're really grateful for the time that you took to engage with us um, and for your support as we tried to find a durable way to protect these tribal resources. Uh, we, gave, we considered every comment very closely um, and did our best to land in a place that put us on a firm legal policy and scientific foundation for future application of this rule. One of the other um, messages that we heard very clearly from many of the comments and one that Administrator Regan has noted um, before is that our shared goal of protecting water resources for tribes is strongest and most effective when it is informed by the lived experience by those who are affected by it. Um, we also heard that different tribes face unique circumstances um, and that there needs to be flexibility in place to decide how best to engage um, any particular water quality standards process um, that may impact the tribe's rights. Um, and so we believe that the tribes should be in the driver's seat to decide whether and when the states and EPA need to consider uh, their reserve rights. And so that is why in the final rule, these requirements are triggered when the tribe chooses to assert their rights for consideration. Now, we know that a tribe's decision on when to assert their rights involves many different factors, including how the water quality standards may affect those rights. And so I wanna underscore that any decisions that are made by tribes under this final rule do not change the legal scope or significance of tribal rights in the water quality standards context or any other context. And the choice not to raise the, um, not to raise in the context of one of the water quality standards will not prevent a tribe from raising that right into the future. We really wanna put the tribes in the driver's seat on this one. Um, and by really explicitly recognizing the tribal reserve rights in water quality standards, we can then ensure that the tribal aquatic resources are abundant and are protected. But just publishing this rule isn't um, all that we're doing. We are also going to be working hard um, towards supporting tribes and states as we're implementing this final rule and applying in the case-specific circumstances with the specific reserve rights and in the um, particular geographic locations. And we think that by clarifying EPA's expectations for water quality standards, we are coming closer to fulfilling the Clean Water Act's um, potential in protecting the clean water that is so economically, culturally, and spiritually vital to tribes. So that is the exciting role that we have today, but that is not all that we're doing, again, um, um, for tribes in water. We have other initiatives under the way as well. Uh, last year, we proposed um, a rule on federal baseline water quality standards for waters on over 250 Indian reservations that don't have them currently. And this rule, this proposed rule, would align with the, the water quality protection that currently is, exists for all the other waters of the United States. Um, and so with these baseline standards in place, EPA can then help safeguard water quality until tribes adopt their own standards for those waters. And we're expecting to finalize this rule uh, by the end of this year too. 
So together, we're hoping that these rules will move us closer to achieving um, water quality protections that are set by the Clean Water Act, uh, while protecting the resources that tribes have relied on since time memorial. So with these critically important actions, I, I just want to thank you all for your support and your leadership, and we really look forward to engaging with you and the tribes, with the states um, on these water quality standards and exploring new opportunities that we expect will emerge from these. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you and pass the back, uh, mic back to Jane. Thank you. It was obviously a very exciting announcement, and I'm so happy that we're able to do it here in Region 10, because as was mentioned, you have been instrumental in moving EPA on so many topics. And <clears throat> while <clears throat> perhaps not as new, I wanted to also highlight another area where the Region 10 tribes have been leaders, and that in addition to protecting reserve rights, we have an obligation to protect treaty rights. And uh, when I first started in EPA, that was, um, I guess, 14 years ago in 2011, the first tribal leader that I met with was Billy Frank Jr. And many of you know, obviously, of his legacy and how inspiring he was. And when I met with him, he shared with me the Treaty Rights at Risk document uh, that you have now championed. And it was not only inspiring, but moving to me as a new uh, EPA official. And so under the Obama administration, what we did is that in our tribal consultation policy, we incorporated a recognition of the treaty rights uh, document. And then we were able in the Obama administration to get nine or eight other federal agencies to sign the, the memorandum. Now, under the Biden administration, we have 17 agencies that have signed the uh, treaty rights uh, memorandum that uh, obligates federal agencies to recognize when we take federal action, <clears throat> the respect for uh, tribal treaties or similar rights, because we also realize that not all tribal nations have treaties, but they have rights that are similar uh, to that. And so again, I just want to applaud the leadership of the nations in this room who have moved the federal agencies to take such actions to protect your tribal treaty rights and reserve rights. In addition, I wanted to mention that as a part of EPA's consultation policy, as I mentioned, not only have we incorporated treaty rights, but we have also incorporated indigenous knowledge into our uh, <clears throat> guidance. And again, I understand that we yesterday, there were several sessions about the importance of indigenous knowledge. So we have, through our consultation policy, a recognition of indigenous knowledge, we know that we also have to educate uh, federal employees or particularly EPA employees on what indigenous rights means to tribal nations and what it means to our federal trust responsibilities. So not only did we have a special uh, seminar uh, with the author of, of Braiding Sweetgrass, but we have also conducted uh, now two webinars, virtual webinars for all uh, EPA employees about indigenous knowledge. And I have to say that those webinars and that engagement has been most uh, the most well attended from what I understand that we have had. So there is a clear interest of EPA employees about understanding the importance of indigenous uh, knowledge and what that means for, uh, again, our federal trans responsibility for tribal nations. We also know that it is our obligation to be able to work and engage with the future generation of tribal leaders, those who will hopefully in 20 years uh, assume the seats that you are now occupying when you become elders. <clears throat> I know that um, it, it is an important task. So we have or are in the process of developing a initiative with tribal youth, with tribal colleges and university. We have an MOU with the American Higher Education Consortium, AHAC, 
And uh, through the MOU, we are also working with individual uh, tribal colleges and university. Again, one of the first tribal colleges and university that I uh, visited was the Northwest Indian College. And I saw firsthand the programs, particularly in terms of protection of indigenous plants and knowledge. And it was uh, a way forward for us in terms of not only uh, working with tribal nations, but with tribal youth and getting them involved, obviously, in the important work that you are doing um, as environmental leaders or, as in, or uh, tribal elders. So with that, I want to, again, thank all of you, not only for your attendance today, but most importantly, for inspiring us at EPA to take the actions that we have discussed today, whether it is the protection of reserve rights, whether it's the protection of uh, treaty rights, or the incorporation of indigenous peoples in international work that we do. It is through these engagements, this dialogue with you, uh, that we have been able to hopefully uh, do the right thing in terms of our trouble, federal trust responsibility and our nation-to-nation -nation responsibility with tribal leaders. So thank you. Many of you know me already, Adam Barron, uh, with uh, Tribal Program Manager in Region 10. And I just wanted to uh, say thank you again to Assistant Administrator Nishida and Deputy Assistant Administrator Wu for choosing, uh, on behalf of Region 10, for first of all coming here today. And as part of the TELS organizer, thank you for uh, coming to make that announcement, an ex extremely exciting announcement. Um, a lot of the folks in this room have done the work that led to those sort of rural priorities, whether it be on traditional ways of food gathering uh, or water quality. Um, a lot of that work came out of Region 10. So it's so appropriate and awesome and exciting to see that announcement in Region 10. Thank you for making it. Um, Randy's going to get up here to talk about the uh, tabletop session we'll do here in a second, but I just wanted to give folks also a charge and, and note to say um, we'll have some breakout sessions coming up uh, for the uh, remainder of the day, so you can get a little bit further uh, into the into the details in some of these programs. <clears throat> and I want to really encourage folks to sort of if you're a water person, maybe you want to go to the air uh, session. If you're an air person, maybe you want to go to the water session. Uh, the whole thing. Oh, you want to come up, Chris? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Wow, what a what an announcement! Thank you, thank you, Jane, and thank you, May. Uh, my name is Russ Hepford. My traditional name is Pilocton, and I'm from uh, Elwha Territory. Port Angeles, Washington is in my territory. We're 17 miles of water from uh, mainland or uh, Vancouver Island, so that imaginary line is like eight or nine miles from my front door. Um, so water quality is very important to my tribe. And, and this rule is, is very important, so thank you. It's, it's uh, been a long path to get there. I was part of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission of 20 tribes that worked on the treaty rights at risk paper. We jokingly call it the white paper because everything was white. And it finally gained some traction, and this is part of that hard work. Uh, the baseline for the 250 tribes, I, at first I thought, well, that's a little paternalistic, you know, telling us what, what the baseline is. But it's a good thing because we didn't, my tribe didn't have water quality standards, so it helps protect us. And I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I really like that and I wanted to acknowledge that because it gives us some protection and gives us a voice. Um, I've been working with the fish consumption rate and water quality for about 30 years now. And in Washington state, we finally agreed to a, a, water, a fish consumption rate 
and then and, and then it got jerked back, and then it got put back in a little differently, and and it's still ongoing. But the tribes conceded uh, 175 grams a day, 10 to the minus five cancer risk, which was we thought would be a good uh, starting point because it did start at six grams a day with no protection for cancer. So we were very excited to get it at least up to 175 like Oregon. I mean, even Denver had 17 grams per day that was better than ours in Washington State. I don't think they have salmon in Denver. They got trout. But I'm very excited for this day. So now we need to work on funding for these baseline tribes and streamlining the water quality standards process. I know I always want more, but this is a very, very good start. And I wanted to uh, acknowledge that and thank EPA for, for listening to us and doing something. You have to have, I, I talked earlier, you have to have patience with governments, United States governments, because they're the baby government. They don't really know what they're doing and we have to show them indigenous knowledge I think they will eventually come around. And I think that's what's going to help states save this planet, not only in the Northwest, but we have indigenous folks all around the world. So, so thank you for that. And when you protect Indian people, whether it's fish consumption rate or water quality standards, if you protect us, you're protecting the general uh, population. And that's better for everybody. So thank you for taking the time to listen and, and thank you for your work. Thank you, Russ. I just wanted to uh, close with this note of, we, we did do a Q and A right now. Many of you might have uh, questions about, well, what does assertion of a, of a treaty right um, look like under this rule? And I just wanna say, when we have these breakout sessions, we've got, um, uh, Office of Water staff um, uh, that will be uh, around so you can start sort of thinking through what this might mean uh, for you and, and your tribe. Um, and also, again, make sure you're not just uh, focusing in on your area expertise. This is really a, a, a chance to mix it up. By the way, and it's not just for those with the tribal programs. It's also for EPA folks. We all tend to get stuck in our silos and the rest of the um, uh, of TELS is really organized to try to break uh, break you out of those. So please take advantage of that opportunity. And I'll welcome up Randy who will walk us through the next table uh, exercise before we do those breakout sessions. Thanks.